connecting. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, this is very exciting. It is. Nice And to meet you. Nice to meet you. I feel slightly nervous, but it's, um, it's a beautiful kind of nervous. Yeah, I'm more nervous because I'm supposed to answer questions. Or I can ask you questions too, right? Yeah, so you're also like not supposed to. So okay. I'll give you a little bit of a background of how this Talk to a Woman came about. Uh, when all of this started, uh, I just found myself, you know, as an artist, you always need to uh, find the direction to communicate your message, to find the right audience, all of this. It's like you constantly need to, not you, I needed to edit myself. And I believe that others in the, in the world of internet needed to do that too. Um, yeah. And then I thought, you know, the world as it was crumbled anyway. Why don't I bring my digital expression to the utmost authenticity? And then I started to talk to a woman, uh, which I dedicate to people that I consider mastered the artistry of their life. And you are one of those people. Oh, far from mastery. <laughs> it's a journey. It's a, it's a long journey. Well, that's, that's, that's the whole point, that I yeah. think mastery is just a realization of having a masterpiece that you envision. Yes, I like that. I like the idea of vision and, uh, and patience also, so we can have a grand vision. And uh, I think over time, um, in the beginning, sometimes a grand vision seems uh, ridiculous, kind of like impossible. But over a long time, um, we start to see that, that it could be possible, that things that you never imagined were possible start to happen. Maybe 10 years later, after you gave up on it, but slowly, things become possible. Hmm. Interesting, <laughs> interesting that uh, throughout my life and practice, I wrestled a lot with the very idea of patience. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, martial arts are the whole energy of that is very explosive and external. Um, what I came to the conclusion of that, I don't need patience. No, no, don't uh, it. no, I don't. Just because leaving my dream, even a fragment of my dream within the capacity that I can right now, it doesn't require patience. It's a privilege. Oh, that's nice. It's a privileged, For example, the vision is an ocean. So today I can contribute just one drop to that ocean. And that is the privilege. So I don't need patience. I just so you, need... Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Like you see patience as a kind of restraint mm -hmm. that, that you don't want to apply to yourself. And so you, you take it, like you said, one drop at a time to fill each yeah. drop a privilege yes it's not to say that patience is the wrong concept it's just patience within my cognitive architecture comes off as an inflammatory uh point unless i look at yeah i get it i see me i think that that's your way of developing patience but it's just language but i think that's that's a beautiful way to stay present and then you don't you don't need patience because You're just being present in the moment. So you're not clinging to the future or anything. Well, I'm meditating on death very often. So oh. I cannot really not be present after that. Yeah. Well, they say it could happen at any moment. <laughs> I think the, way, the reason I develop patience has to do with um, other people too, because it's my, I mean, I get really impatient. Um, and, and like, I don't practice martial arts, but, um, but I just throw things, you know, and break things. <laughs> oh, this, this is wonderful. This is great. I do, own, I do this too. <laughs> yeah. It's my own form of martial arts without any kind of skill. And, uh, and so, um, I have to talk to myself a lot and say, um, you know, I just can't see, I can't always see like how, 
how close things really are to happening or or um exactly why someone is acting the way they're acting and uh and it's, and I know from experience that it will be revealed later and that's what gives me what I would call patience um well, but I I like your viewpoint it's interesting when you when you said that it it will be revealed later it, it's an interesting way to look at this though recently i think i first asked myself do i really want to know yeah the moral of this story when there is a reveal you know imagine that if it's a if it's a storytelling narrative right it means there is a story attached to a person in our life mm -hmm. right and sometimes mm -hmm. i'm just making a decision do i really is this movie is really is in, is it really that interesting to mm -hmm. watch till the end and uh very often i choose that no you choose to turn it off yes yes obviously yeah that's a good choice if it's not a good movie um, well sometimes the movie could be good but it's just not interesting to know the end yeah yeah i think i think we don't um i mean even even the ideas that i have I watch myself. I have a lot of good visions and ideas and like about maybe I would like to think like 30% of them actually turn out to be good and and reveal themselves. Um but yeah, you can't really we can't really know. We didn't we don't know anything. I guess it's no point. But it's like in Chinese medicine, I always go back to that. The 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 idea of vision of having a vision of the future and moving towards that vision and, and and working towards it and and even getting impatient about it is all that wood element. Mhm. Mm it's like about growth and change. And I love that in the Chinese system that 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 the liver which is the wood element and and the spirit of the liver is something that is said in that system to go on after we die. So it's like it keeps even after your body dies there's this thing that keeps trying to become and and grow and change and that maybe i don't know if you believe in reincarnation i don't know if i do but it's like it carries on into the next dimension or whatever comes next um with that same vision of and uh i think i i like creating visions like it's an art like you said life is like it's an artistry and it's exactly what you said is is being able to envision that is really um like being an artist and we're we are we are artists of our own lives and that that's but that's the liver and it's the same thing that makes anger and well, fighting well i have something to contribute to this it will be so you know the martial art especially the one I'm specialized in in Chinese as wu shu right the first character is wu the second character is shu so wu would be martial warrior military in the context of the character and uh but if you speak about other forms of art ballet fine art um uh, performance art we would mm -hmm. say yi shu right so it would be e character and then the character shu and the shu in yi shu would be the same character that would be in wu shu so the character shu meaning art is this immaterial element that essentially brings the substance to action mm -hmm. so if we look at all of what you said about the artistry previously through the prism of this being an artist is inescapable and by doing so we are basically standing in the way of the natural flow of the mm -hmm. creation by the fact of existence by the fact of existence <laughs> yeah well we're we're creating by existing oh yeah oh just by being yes we're so that creating. yes yeah, that that i i like what you said you mentioned something in in before we started this you said something about cognition and i was like what is she, what does she mean by cognition you know and then i looked it up <laughs> and then 
it is the same as perception. And, and I like to talk about perception. I mean, it's similar to the idea of perception, which means to create, really. Well, cognition, cognition is perceiving. Right, it's so perception. The mechanism. I mean, in, you know, like from the Buddhist perspective, too, which I study also, is like, is like creating. It's you create a reality. It looks like that it's there. You know about emptiness. But you're actually, through perception, you're creating your reality. You don't even realize it. And that's... I, um, I, I do. I mean, you do. But you don't <laughs> <want to do. laughs> no, you're amazing. I saw... I, I was, I was you, like, you blown away amazing. by your... By your um, the artwork, on, just on your Instagram alone. And some of the things that I read about your studies and travels and everything. Uh, speaking of... Chinese concepts, uh, Aaron, you are masterfully communicating uh, Eastern concepts uh, without stripping them of, it's very audacious to say the word essence, right? Because the, the true essence is so deep that nobody knows whether we yeah. can really grasp it, but without losing its authenticity. How did you how did you get to this level of mastery um, of communicating Eastern concepts? Um, I, well, first of all, I had a really good teacher. I had a bunch of really good teachers. But my teacher of Chinese medicine um, is a really intense and brilliant individual. His name is Mark Seem. He wrote a bunch of books. And I read all his books before I ever met him. And I would like cry when I read his books. And then I finally met him. And, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of far out. But, um, but it's always with the teacher. It's always like something is, is transmitted. Um, of an, I think it's like the essence that you're talking about. Like, it's really not something that you can learn out of a book. It's some kind of feeling. And, well, that's that's what intrigued me that you are able to communicate the feeling um the feeling that lies in eastern concepts in the est of, in the essence uh, in, in the in the west of the world excuse me without without flattening them well, the other thing is I was practicing yoga the whole time I was learning Chinese medicine. And, and it was magical because I'd been doing yoga for, for a pretty long time before that and, and teaching it even. But when I started to learn about, like, about the organs and the pathways that connect the organs, and then I was still doing my, you know, do my two-hour yoga practice, and I was like, wow holy shit this is like all in there i could feel it and and meditation and then i was listening to this lecture this morning about the history of yoga and i could be making this up but i really did listen to this lecture but um uh it was talking about how um when whoever was writing the text talking about um moving energy in the body like when they first started doing hatha yoga it was like basically um like mortification of the body like they were just trying to hurt themselves and get out of their body and then somewhere along the way it changed and it became this internal practice of moving energy instead of like trying to just hurt yourself and suffer it really started that way um and you can still see people who practice it that way especially in india but anyway and then it started to become more like chinese medicine and it and it turns out that the first texts that were written like that were written by um buddhists and that they were probably influenced by chinese medicine and that somehow like that came into the yoga system and i was i was like amazed by that I don't know if that interests anyone else, but because I just realized that the transformation of yoga maybe even happened through the influence of, of what was really, I guess, the Taoist practices, like, like, I wanted, I wanted to ask you something here, but uh, 
it's kind of a controversial and it's out of my own mind. So um, oh, good. I can't really back it up by anything, but other than, you know, a decade of living there. So, um, so, you know, Taoism, this is a little, this is going to be, this is going to go a little bit towards psychology and uh, psycho spirituality slightly. So, um, you know, Taoism, essentially, it's very much cause and effect. If we need it to simplify, right? It's very much cause and effect. It's very much plus minus. Boom, light bulb is, is lightning. I mean, I believe you would understand what I'm referring to. And then when Gautama Buddhism was coming, you know, that way from, you know, India, mm -hmm. a lot of that, a lot of things there are about to slightly avoiding responsibility for the shit. Oh, you know, you just, you, you've been a bad girl like, like previous life. So that's why you're suffering. That's why we're going to go through the practices. And I'm not against, this is just my own cognitive uh, ping pong game, right? And then mm -hmm. I think that Buddhism was, became so popular there as well because Taoism is too much of a practice of responsibility. And oh, then yeah. people could drop it towards Gautama Buddhism. That's why Taoism became less popular. And then Buddhism, I mean, that's, that's my imagination. Buddhism is very much like, other, in some ways, like other fundamentalist religions. It's funny. It, yeah. it does, it, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> that's not what I was talking about. I was talking more about the Asian influence of the internal pathways. But, but I know, um, I know. That's why I said yeah, I could yeah. add something like outside of this topic, but a little bit what came to my mind. Yeah, I was thinking about that this morning. Just, just I like Tao Taoism a lot. I don't say it right. Like you, you have very good pronunciation. Do you speak Chinese, by the way? No, mm. no, <laughs> no. It's terrible. I, I am terrible at that. I tried to learn it, um, and then I got. Then I started learning Spanish for a different reason. Well, I had no choice. You know, I wouldn't have survived. So I had to yeah, learn well, Chinese. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. I, I, I still hope to do that one day. Um, but, I, but I do think it's fascinating. I think Taoism is something, um, is one of the most beautiful religions, or if you want to call it a religion or way I, of life. That... I think it's a, it's a, it's a practice. Mm. Yeah. And it's also a practice and imagination of an orderly system oh. that would be opposite to the entropy. Oh, really? I, I just like the way it's all constructed. Even, even spiritual, spiritually inclined things such as, you know, hungry ghosts you know, residents of the thin world, uh, deeper, authentic stuff, even that, even though it's so spiritual and rather rarely graspable by human mind rooted into very social reality, it still has so much order. It's almost mm. like a science. Hmm. It's like an order, but out of the unknowable kind of. I don't know. I I would like to hear more about it and learn and learn more about. Well, I'm not. Way. I'm not saying I'm no. So I moved to China, um, like twelve years ago, uh, and uh, I moved to China not because I even wanted to study. Like I couldn't study because I'm from you know kind of, I'm from, I don't know if you know where it is, I'm from Crimea. So I was born three years before Soviet collapsed. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, yes, so I was uh, hired, I, my first job in China was in Shanghai theater. So I was working there. And only then when I chose to stay in China and made it uh, physically possible, this is when I went around and uh, learned from 
very, very kind of like philosophically anarchistic places, if you will. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, but at the same time, you know, I, I had to come back and from that kind of side in, of China to working on Chinese TV, you know, which is mm -hmm. a very, very, very different balance. So, you know, so I was very much against social media at the times and against mm -hmm. capturing everything. Like I, like I, I don't, like it's so unnatural. You're having this moment when you, when you look at the water and some concept that was just delivered to you suddenly becomes alive and it becomes mm -hmm. you and then you, you, you're changed. And somehow I couldn't understand that I need to take a picture of that and I just put it on the internet and explain. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and yes. And then, and then I started to look more into the Western world and, and then like the idea of, everybody wanted to be enlightened like what for so uh yeah so like going to heaven no i the, that's that's why i i'm staying in the i know it's kind of like a big circle i gave you like a big circle of information that wasn't order wasn't wasn't orderly enough to to lead to a specific point but the current state is i think artistic expression is the purest form of spirituality and i personally in any means i'm not looking to be enlightened this is not yeah. my desire i i agree with you a hundred percent i think that um art is is the only real liberation and that um we can that's just me i i I used to only do art. Um, well, I did science first, and then, and I and I saw a kind of freedom in artistic expression that you can't find anywhere else. And that, and in that freedom, for me anyway, I could find out what was true or not true. Well, true is a temporary. Well, maybe. I guess. In, in some ways. Um, I mean, maybe uh, what I mean by what the truth that I found or that I, or that I could get glimpses of was something um, that you, it's like, uh, it's like you can't have the confines of religion. Yes or any kind of dogma. You can't have the confines of science, which are extremely limiting, Western science, or any system. Even Chinese medicine is like a prison in a oh, way. Yeah. Yes, it's, it is. It's like a very limited way, lens. It's cool to see it th through these thousands of years of, of development. But um, in art, I can make up a new whole system of medicine and call it art. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It doesn't matter if anything. It could be complete. Erin, what make, what makes something true? Right. But the fact that I that I envisioned it and and made it and its intricacies is 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 allowing it to become true. And I imagine that that's how Chinese medicine developed in the first place. And I try to teach it that way. The same with yoga. It's like at some point, somebody created this system. And that was the artist. That was the genius of the artist behind that whole system. He made it up or she made it up. Same Probably with she. Yoga. Probably. <laughs> well, what, maybe it was like <laughs> something in between. Who knows? But, um, but somebody made it up. And I think, and the rest of us were like, that's beautiful. I love it. And and then we can we we can use it and replicate. It. But I I do think that, uh, and I, I I enjoyed I made up this whole mythology, like a whole new. Like I think Greek mythology is cool, but I think we can make up a whole entire new mythology. I mean, people have done that, like Lord of the Rings or stuff like that, 
where it's like a deep, profound, spiritual kind of universe, a whole new one. And, and we can keep doing that. Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe the truth, you know, is, but I, f I feel like there's something there that we're um, centered around. Um, but maybe not. Maybe it's just the void. Hmm. It doesn't have a center. Interesting. What, 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 what is your, what are your thoughts on the idea of balance? Do you believe in balance? Balance? Balance, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for health, it's important. Well, for example, I don't believe in balance as a, as a, as a constant. I think I believe in the act of balance. Oh, like mm -hmm. you keep going, you have to go back and forth. Well, I don't feel the balance as a constant idea exists. Definitely, it's going to keep changing. And then the act of balance, you, you know, like when you're, the adjustment is an act of balance. Right, it's an action. I see what you mean. I came to this realization because, you know, I, I'm very, I have very, I'm very competitive. And even reaching the balance would be a competition with myself. So then I would be grasping for that balance. Oh, yeah. I would grasping for that balance. And then because it doesn't exist in its constant, I would be grasping upon something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it's like a constant chase of an illusion. And then with time, I started to see it as an act of balance. And act is something I can engage with. It's an actionable item. So, in yeah, some I see, way. I see like your, your photographs and the movements in your videos, the little stuff on your, I mean, the stuff I've seen on your Instagram is like, I kind of feel that way when I look at them is like, it's, it's not that they're symmetrical. There's a, there's a movement in them. They have like a, it's really beautiful. Thank you. And I, and, and I do wonder about what it, it, like, you made me think of this, or maybe you said it, but like, what is it? Where is the center? There has to be a center. It's like, if we're finding balance. Center? Maybe, maybe we in, create a center. And maybe in cognition. Not, in cognition, cognition. That's what I wanted to talk about because mm -hmm. Cognition is a, is, a, is a deciding mechanism. It's a mechanism that perceives and makes a conclusion. So the center is where we decided to be. It's like the, the well, is it kind of like, well, I teach yoga and, and breathing and meditation, but I talk about, in the, like in the yoga sutras it talks about the seer mm -hmm. that what you mean by cognition like the seer the one that perceives I not would, the perception but the I, perceiver i would say that um, if we were to look into spirituality for finding the synonymous for that yes and we can also look into quantum physics when there's a yeah. the such idea that particles behave differently when we look and when we don't well, they don't react yeah, right. They don't behave at all until they're. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so you see, oh, so, so the cognition, the deciding factor, this is psychology, which is my academic background, right? So I was speaking from the perspective of psychology. You gave me the sentiment that would be the perspective of spirituality. And then we can also go to quantum physics and look mm -hmm. there for for the perspective on the same thing. Mm -hmm. I just, um, in my practice, I like to, um, I like to bring everything to self because I decide. Because you what? Because I decide where is the center. Mm -hmm. And uh, by doing so, I'm accepting the ultimate responsibility for, for the effect, you know, 
and I and I also ultimately empowering myself by accepting mm -hmm. the responsibility for the effect. This prevents um, the person or myself from falling and grasping upon the concept that is outside of myself, mm -hmm. which allows me to beautifully coexist and learn from the concepts that are available to me mm -hmm. from this centered. I don't like to use the word centered because nowadays a lot of words are recycled, especially in English words. Mm -hmm. uh, so you start to, everybody speaks alignment, balance, energy. They don't, many mm -hmm. people don't even know what it means. Um, so in a way, it keeps me centered and I can, in a quality way, merge with some other ideas and concepts without losing myself. Mm. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I mean, I, I'm really into, I, first of all, I love quantum physics also. And, and I think it, it is like um, everyone should study it so they can understand how important perception is or cognition. Well, this is what we're going right now. We're going through, we're involuntary participating in the war of perceptions with physical consequences. What, you mean this quarantine thing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that the, um, the Yoga Sutras is a really, it's not really that spiritual. If you, if you really look at it, it's about, it's like a science of perception. Of how the yes. mind perceives. Yes. I guess I was, I was just speaking on the level of semantics, right? Because okay. you would use spiritual terms right here. I it would say, yeah. yes, yes. So I didn't, but that's good yeah. that you pointed out. Yeah. It's like, it's like a psychology book kind of to talk about exactly what you were talking about. The way you said it was beautiful. Just that, that when you, when you recognize that you are the uh, one, the artist, or the, the that you are deciding the center. That's cool. Then you take responsibility. So yes, important. I I think that. I think um, maybe it's an evolution of basically the fabric of society. I just thought the society and then I thought, you know, America is not the only country, but the Western society, right? I need to clarify, takes, it kind of like takes people away from the responsibility in many ways. So it yeah, becomes, to blame stuff yeah, it becomes people. uncool to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if we can inspire people to think that it's cool to take responsibility, I think it's a it's a beautiful message. It's 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 everything. I mean, that's what I I'm trying to I'm teaching these really weird lectures on sexuality and sexual relationships, and this is probably a little dangerous. But in in the current well, up until now, you mean dangerous in 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 America? Yeah, that's right now in America the um the attitude towards towards sexuality is is very much like an attitude of a victim victimization and uh i as a female take offense to that um i that I, I i feel like it's very disempowering in that um me personally i prefer to see things differently and to be like you said the center and to and to take responsibility, um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm saying I'm, this on your show, not on <laughs> my show. Well, I, 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 fully un I fully understand your point, uh, yeah. though I think that in America, specifically taking a position on that matter, is sensitive oh yeah it's very dangerous um because we have to recognize the suffering the pain and suffering uh, of all the people um 
involved in that. And I think a lot of the issues of sexuality arise from uh, repression and shame on, on all sides of the game. I mean, I, I brought up on like Orthodox Christian background where they like force you to study this at school and stuff. To I, study I, what? I, religion. I know, oh. yeah, I know Old Testament <laughs> and New Testament by heart. So, but this is this is another yeah. conversation. Yeah, but yeah, yeah well, but that, that, I, that I understand. I understand. But Orthodox. It's like two so, different religions. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I understand. I understand the point very mm -hmm. much. Probably, mm -hmm. probably too much. Yeah. Anyway, I think. I think empowerment always comes from taking responsibility and and uh, disempowerment whether uh whether anyone is right or wrong it doesn't matter it matters where you can um remain in the center and where you can um uh, reclaim the power that you have which can't really be taken away from you I mean it's easy for me to say that And I and I when I think about it, I try to think of the people whose power has most obviously been taken away, like people who who are held captive. Um, and I'm like, how can that that that's so terrible? And we have so much freedom. Um, and I think about the whole history of of women, and how only very very recently as far as I know from reading things, um, we were we able to um, have really have a life, even a separate identity, and that we're just barely coming into that. Um, and, and it is still seem like a fight, an important You fight. know, I've noticed that the world is going through cycles of voluntary amnesia. Mm. Forgetting, well, forgetting very important pivotal points in the history, mm -hmm. so that in twenty or thirty years, the, this idea or can resurface and and it could be a thing again, especially in the media. Which idea? Any idea. There's a oh. lot in terms of. I, it it was a little bit to to what you were saying about women. Yeah, nobody wants to talk about it. I know. <laughs> on on another note, what is your long term visionary inspiration and everyday inspiration? Oh, um, well. Um, Everyday inspiration. I would say my everyday inspiration comes from um, just the sun rising up and and uh, um, connect. I I meditate, and that's that's really how I connect to the to the positivity in my heart, which I find. Um, I love creativity, so if I can cre if I can come up with a new idea or a new write something or or um, make something, then I get really excited about it. If I have a new project, I get really excited about it. So I always have too many projects. I think that's like that's what inspires me. Hmm. The constant motion. Yeah, just constant creation to the point of almost chaos and normally i really love people even though i'm kind of a recluse i i love new people i love to meet people um and learn about people and learn from people um i've been really lucky to have some of the most amazing teachers and and incredible people around me and and that um that's what i get really excited about is learning and, and creating. I was thinking a lot about 
you know, the, the structure of the world is irreversibly broken. The previous structure, in my view. When I say the word broken, I don't use it as a negative connotation, as a factual statement. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking about that there the new system of values in some ways are will have to be involuntary built or created or accepted within everyone individually. Yeah. One time my friend, my best friend, she's older than me. She got like, she got really upset one day. She watches all this conspiracy stuff. Anyway, she came over and she was like, um, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna make these microchips and they're gonna put them in our brains and, you know, they're gonna control us from blah, 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 whatever. I don't remember this, but she told me this the other day and she goes, and she told me that I said, that's great. <laughs> that's great. We won't even know. <laughs> It'll seem the same to us. And uh, it's like, um, I think that that's, it's true. It's already happening, you know, with this kind of interface with the, with the digital. And it's like we we can perceive or um, be the or cognition. We can perceive through all these different bodies, different forms. We can come as a robot. We can come in human. We can come through. Who knows what and it won't matter because we we will perceive and and then in that way whether it is a microchip or a virus invading us or we're the one who decides if it's good or bad we have we have the um, ability to perceive it and that's all we can ever really do Interesting what came to mind. I was, um, I was working for a little bit in Hong Kong. Um, there was a day at Hanson Robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's basically where the AI is made. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, I was observing uh, the, the new Sophia because there's like a different level <laughs> of Sophia. Uh, a new Sophia being trained trained in humanity <laughs> it, it's it's an interesting like how to be a human i guess you know they're they're not trying to be a human they try to understand humanity in that sense does not mean being human humanity is a feature there there are humans that have no humanity but mm -hmm. there potentially could be a robot full of humanity. Probably, right? Yeah, well, They're that's looking. at least that's at least what's envisioned there. So I had an opportunity to to work with them for a very short time. That's so cool. I love the idea of of creating something that's that becomes conscious. I mean, do you think yes. it's possible? Well, I think that uh, I think that everything. I think we're living in the in the world where we create stories and we create those avatars and entities. I mean, even look at the business. You create an imaginary entity. You register it. You give it value out of your own mind, mm -hmm. and then you take responsibility accordingly. Isn't mm -hmm. it? Isn't it something a life made out of nothing, and then based on how you use it, it becomes assigned emotional qualities. In a right. sense, my name is Svetlana Zavialova, and I've created a woman. A woman mm -hmm. was originally based on myself, 
But then now a woman has other qualities because I also have visionary warrior meditations. Um, and when people go through those meditations, they assign qualities to a woman. And some of those qualities are not the same qualities with Svetlana. So here we go. Something out of nothing becomes and that is conscious. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not even a robot. Um, mm-hmm. It's the idea. And our idea gains strength and vitality by interaction with others. And it could live on after we die. Oh, well, it depends if it matters to the originator. I don't care. What, I don't care that people keep something after I die. I, it does, it's not my interest. I, don't, I, I, want to, I want to be interacting and enriching people's lives and inspire them now. No, I, don't, no. I don't care when I die. It's, oh, um, cool. Yes, because... But it will change the future. Just like we each do, right? It depends. You know, the future is like... Um, in Chinese, it's uh, uh, how to say it in English. Um, the fan, you know, Chinese fan. When you open it, mm-hmm. so there's a multiplicity of uh, futures exist at the same time. So every single moment, every single interaction, a word and um, feeling, sense, it's changing the future. But there is a multiplicity of futures exists at the same time. And there is also every perspective has its own multiplicity of futures. So when you say changing the future, my question would be, which one? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe all of them. I don't know. Um. So... Yes, I want to ask you a question. So every time I wrap those talk to a woman interviews slash chats, I, um, I'll repeat the story. I, I tell the story every time. Um, you know, we are talking right now with you. So it's a dimension of time that is so simultaneously experienced by people that are online right now. And then when people are watching it within 24 hours, that's people in the future in the dimension of time. So our interaction, energy, and messages are traveling in the future. And then when this is somewhere in recording and people are watching it in the future, mm-hmm. we're traveling in the future. So in that sense, what is your message today to the people of the future? <laughs> oh. Let's see. That's a good question. Or to your um, future, because we are also people future. of the future. Of course, we're also will be in the future. So technically, we could direct the message to ourselves as well. Yeah, um, I would say that um, we're the same. You know the. That, that there is that part of, to me, it's, it's a part of us that seems to be moving through time, but it's not moving through time. I mean, I feel like we will be exactly the same. Everything will keep changing. It will seem good and it will seem bad. Um, but... Um, we should uh, we should just appreciate the moment and and remember um, remember the past also and I know there's probably many different pasts just like there are many different futures um, but we can we can learn from looking back. Um, 
on the path that we've taken. And, and even before our own lives, we can, we can learn a lot from history. And, and uh, even though there were stories that were told, I think I didn't understand that until I got a lot older. Probably everyone says that. Um, but that it's important to study history. And remember, remember the people of the past, even though we're the same, we're exactly the same. We were always alive. Somehow. This is a beautiful <laughs> message. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Especially for me in the moment of now. Well, Erin, thank you so much for joining. Oh, thank you so you. much for You're authenticity. So smart. You're amazing. It's really, I'm glad there's people like you with brilliant minds and, and creative minds doing what you're doing. So thank you for, for choosing to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I'm blushing, you know, my honor to talk to you. And, you know, I'm hoping to talk to you off record as well. Okay, great. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, have a good day. Be in touch. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.